Numerical Computation, Chapter 8, Video 5. In this video, we will learn least square method for continuous function. So let's look at the problem setting first. So we are given a function f of x defined on the interval from a to b. And also we are given a set of basis functions, we call it gi and i from 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to n, also on the same interval. The goal now is to find a function g, which is a linear combination of all the basis functions, that is, each gi is multiplied by a coefficient ai, and we sum them all up. And the function shall be constructed in a way that the arrow is minimized, and where the arrow is defined as the L2 norm of the function f minus g on the interval from a to b, this will be the integral from a to b of fx minus gx square dx. We first notice that the arrow function actually is a function of those coefficients ai's because after we plug in the expression for g, we see we have g equals to the sum over ai and gi. And then on the whole right-hand side, f is given, all the gi's are given, the ai's are the ones we need to find. And the arrow depends on our choices of these ai's. And we also know when this arrow function reaches the minimum, then the partial derivative with respect to each ai must be zero. Now let's look at um, what these partial derivatives will be. So for convenience we repeat the arrow function over here and now we take partial derivative with respect to a i. So um, one can um, differentiate the integral and then integrate afterwards. And if we do that, we see we have a constant 2 coming out. And uh, I will have 2 multiply whatever is in here. So I copy down whatever is in here. And now since the index i is being used to indicate which a we are differentiating, so I have to use different um, index. Let's use j here. Okay. And then the chain rule says I need to differentiate this expression in ai, thinking everything else is constant. So you know, f doesn't contribute anything. All the terms here where j does not equal to i are constant. They don't contribute anything. The only term that contributes to this derivative is where j equals to i. And what you will get will be exactly the coefficient in front of that term, which gives me g at i. At x, and so that's what's written here, and that shall equal to zero. Well, we can probably get rid of the two, which doesn't really matter, and we distribute the g into each, and we write into two separate integrals. So the integral of g i times f i shall a minus the integral of g i times the sum of all those g's shall be zero. So um. Keeping our mind clear that these a, j's are my unknowns, so I would keep my unknown on the left-hand side of the equation, and this term does not contain my unknown, so I move it to the right-hand side. And also, I can switch the order of the integral and the summation, since they are both finite, and uh, also realize that a, j does not depend on x, so I can pull it outside the integral sign. So I can write it like this. Okay, and this holds for i from 1 to all the way to n. So I basically have n equations here, and I have n unknowns of those coefficients a's. Okay, so I have the last equation rewritten here, and we want to um, write these equations into a matrix vector form. So we realize that what's stating here on the left hand side is basically is a matrix times vector operation writing out in one row. So 
This means I can write it into a C matrix times an A vector equals to a B vector, where the coefficient matrix C, let's say the IJ component is in, denoted as CIJ, CIJ will exactly equal to this integral here that's in front of AJ. So that's what I will have. Okay? And the B vector is the right-hand side. So it's just this one will go into the Bith position. So we would like to comment that this matrix C here is actually symmetric. And C, Cij equal to Cji is exactly because if you switch i and j here, the product does not change. So theoretically, if the basis functions Gi, they are linearly independent of each other, then this matrix C will be non-singular and therefore invertible. And the system Ca equals to B will have a unique solution. We now consider a special case where we chose an orthogonal set of basis functions. So um, we would say the basis functions gi are orthogonal to each other if the following holds. So for every i does not equal to j, and I integrate from a to b, gi times gj dx, I shall get 0. Okay, and then they are orthogonal. So recall the expression for cij, which is exactly this integral. So if your basis functions are orthogonal to each other, then that means cij, the coefficient matrix, all these entries are 0 if i does not equal to j, which means all the non-diagonal elements are 0. So the only non-zeros are on the diagonal, therefore the C matrix is diagonal. And if a matrix is diagonal, then to solve the system is rather trivial because each equation is decoupled from the others. One can just solve it straightforward. Okay, so what will be the diagonal element here? CII will be GI times GI, so it's GI squared, so you know that will not be zero because basis functions are not zero. And then the AI will simply equal to the BI over AII. Okay, so plug in the expression. The bi is the gi times f integrated, and the aii is the gi square integrated. Okay, next video we will look at some um, typical examples of orthogonal basis and see um, how to work out a least square um, approximation. Okay, so hope you enjoy this and see you next time.